Welcome to Captured by Women, the all women host show which dissects current affairs issues from the perspectives of women. I am Dedo Kofi, an entrepreneur. I'm here with my co host, Elizabeth Olympio Emmanuel. I'm a restaurateur. Nansata Yakubu, I'm a development consultant. In this episode of Captured by Women, suspected arsonists set fire to Cyrus oil gas pipeline in Tema barely a week after alleged saboteurs cut down a pipeline also in the Tema enclave. Are these incidents merely coincidental or were seeing the manifestations of a more sinister torrent of economic sabotage? The perennial Accra flooding and the state of our emergency response systems, NADMO, fire, ambulance, what has changed since the June 3rd disaster? We will also be looking at the university's draft bill and whether that is an affront to academic freedoms in Ghana. We'll be right back with the spin. Welcome back from the break. So ladies, we have um, this issue of the Cyrus, Cyrus oil gas pipeline, which was almost burnt. What's our take on it? Hmm. This is leading to economic sabotage. Two incidents within a very short space of time to critical power sources. This is an oil gas pipeline, which is supplying oil or gas to probably a power station or um, to some source of uh, power use. Previously, we had grid coal pylons being vandalized as well. It is quite strange to have our installations being tampered with. These are high security and I power. I think it raises the is, issue of security. Like, absolutely. Yeah. And if this is happening, I think we should set up sentry posts, high sentry posts where you have security manning them and, hey, if that suggestion of protecting the lines is, is needed, we do so. I, I also think that in this, the technology can also be used alongside you know, the physical manning of the space and having people there to apprehend culprits or bandits who would want to vandalize it. I think that with most of these lines, they can also put in some kind Senses. of sensors or, some, or yeah. light when you get around it. It okay. kind of booms out. We don't know if this was the case, but the good news is that they, they, didn't succeed. they didn't succeed. But what if they had? That would have been a much more you and know, the terrible that, trend. The fact that they had enough time to attempt it goes yes. to the fact, goes to point to the fact that we need to have man guards there. If the military, exactly. we can actually dis, um, deploy the military yes. to be every one kilometer, two people walking the lines. I know it's a long distance to do, but we need to make sure that culprits or saboteurs are apprehended. Yeah, but in this case, the, the oil company, the, I think it's a private firm. Yes. It's, I think this is maybe what we would call an early warning also for them. Because sometimes when these lines are on the surface, the mm. access is, I think, easier easy. for yeah. people who want to be mischievous. So as they have stated that it's still something, and I, I don't think it's in full use, it's probably being laid or being part of a longer term plan. It pro they might have to relook really at how they will position them to, to be more yeah. safe. And the safety has to be. But like you said about the, the security, I thought there security, was security. Yeah. They, they, That's they were something we don't them. know because obviously and there's for every business, there's so many ways to secure your business. If you own a shop, you put in cameras mm -hmm. to make yeah. sure that um, you can check things. And so for an oil company or for power generating company, whichever it falls in, they should know the security that is available for them. Apart from man guards, um, yes. there are systems you can put in place, like technology. Yeah. There should be cameras, outdoor cameras that can work in spaces like that. So we don't know if they had those things in place or they didn't and they were, bre and they were breached. But we heard from the, the head of uh, security for Gridco, mm -hmm. who, I mean, I think coming on the back of what they suffered just in a couple of weeks ago, were also a part of this because it's all within the, the Tema enclave. And he was making some very wild, you know, 
assertions, maybe in the heat of the moment about what they, they would they would do they would to do their that. to their to you know the their culprits if they are they are caught on site. Punished. Punished. I mean instant, <laughs> instant justice, justice. Instant justice. You know, if, if they are caught uh, on site. But then he also uh, mentioned that they would work with uh, the, the police, the military, yes. and other. So. They need to heighten the security around such installations because it is actually a suicide mission. If you're going to set ablaze a supposed gas or oil pipeline, you prepare to, to die blast, with yeah. it because it's going to just go boom. If there is indeed gas in there. Yeah, yeah, there was there was this thing in the public domain that it was actually water that was in there. Yeah. In the, in the pipelines really? and not and not so uh, they were looking we, for some we water to drink. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some water yeah. searching going on as well. Yeah. So probably but then I think much more <laughs> but I also think that like we, we were even discussing off air. I think the issue is whether it's water or not. A pipe gas line is major investment. It is and it's definitely investment. there for oil and gas. So if people are attempting now what what's the precedent so they the have to question is for? why why would they want to do that? Who is doing it and why would they want If so, I live in the country and I know that the pipeline is there to yeah. um, supply us yeah. with X, Y, Z. So why would I want to, to sabotage yeah, what's the, the intention? Is it a rivalry people? company doing that or is it, what has it got to do? Our, why why um, would anybody do Our that? security agencies should be up and doing. We are depending on them to get to the bottom of this because this is two incidents too many. In, yeah. Too many, Within too many, and very risky. A, a pylon that carries over a thousand watts of power. That's yeah. That you will be fried as a fish in no yeah. time. If you, if you and burn. then you're going to cut up and burn. You're not just cutting it up. You're actually putting it ablaze because there was a little fire on the pipeline. The pictures that came out in the media, yeah. it had caught fire and. It did not eventually in flame up. Engulf, yeah. In, in I, I think and with flame. the issue of Gridco as well, there there is an alleged political sabotage being um, out there in the on public. The pylons. Yes, okay. the, the fact that oh. um, there is, and that's where sometimes we should draw the line because almost every issue is politicized. No, we shouldn't. We it shouldn't. Be. To, I mean, yeah. whoever is who, it's, it shouldn't be the issue. The, issues should be addressing what's happened. Something's gone wrong. Somebody's done something wrong. So what do we do uh, about it? Instead of starting to play um, politics with some with of the these things that yeah. come yeah. up. Whoever yeah. is the culprit should be dealt with and when should found. be prevented. Yeah. More of prevention. Yeah. Well, I guess there's a word to the wise. The agencies should secure their installations. The security agencies should be up and doing, get to the bottom of it. We don't want this case to die a natural death and then here the next installation or pipeline has been damaged and been, they've been successful at it. The whole nation stands to lose. True. Coming up next on Captured by Women is a craft flooding and the state of our emergency response systems in Ghana. Perennial Accra flooding and our strategic response systems, NADMO, fire, ambulance. What has changed since the June 3rd disaster? Joining us today from the Engineering Council, the Registrar, Engineer Wise Amatape, we will discuss this into detail. Engineer Wise, you're most welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you for being among women. <laughs> so, what has changed since the June third disaster? Well, flooding in yeah. Accra. Um, since the June third disaster, that's twenty fifteen, uh, quite a number of uh, uh, events with respect to flooding have changed, but not too uh, dramatic. Um, before the June third, uh, twenty fifteen. The whole of Kole Lagoon was almost uh, heavily silted to the brim. We had a, an interceptor, uh, we popularly called the Klep Interceptor, which is a, a structure built between the, the lagoon and the Odo to intercept the flow so as to divert 
what we call the dry weather flow. Dry weather flow means flows that occur during the dry time when there is no rain. This flow is uh, supposed to be highly polluted. So the interceptor was built with the mind that it can take that water off the lagoon so as to free the lagoon to get the lagoon free for recreational activities and all that. So the interceptor was built. At that time, the interceptor was heavily silted. The gates, it has 20 gates. All the gates were choked, couldn't be opened at all. And so virtually Accra was living behind a dam, more or less. Because if the gates could not open, it means the flow could not go downstream into the lagoon and finally empties into the sea. So at that time, that was not functioning. Then if you look at the Odok channel itself, the Odok channel was so silted, heavily silted, to such an extent that we can, we can even get uh, animals, cows and uh, goats grazing on the, the channel itself. So now all this having done, the Odok channel has been desilted to almost to the floor, the con it has a concrete floor from Caprais all the way to Abosokai or Agwabloshi Bridge. That was desilted, clean, neatly, and uh, it's only now that the silt is building up gradually, but not to that extent when it was uh, 2015. Then the Klep interceptor was also clean. The gates, 17 out of the 20 gates have been opened. So now flood comes and it flows directly into the lagoon. So it means the gate, uh, the interceptor is no longer functioning as it was designed because there were some falls and the falls need, needed to be rectified. So is this to say that area today, when it rains, does not experience any more flooding? Oh, well, definitely. It's, it's still experiencing flooding, as okay. we saw in the, just yes. some two days back. It experienced flooding, but there are certain factors that contribute to the flooding of uh, uh, that uh, business area. Yes. Yeah, even though if you clean all these facilities, that area will still be clean if those factors are not removed. Yeah, maybe during the course of the discussions we can there's, come back to those There's factors. a worrying trend mm -hmm. of builders building in waterways. Yeah. What remedy has been put in place for structures that are in waterways to pave way for the water? Yeah, uh, actually it's um, a worrying uh, phenomenon while people have gone to informally settle in waterways, which is quite bad. Uh, it's often said that if you don't know how to run, you must know how to hide. So if we don't have the resources to develop the channels, then it means people should not occupy the flat plains so as to let the flood spread in that area without causing any harm. But however, much has not been achieved in that aspect where people will have to be moved. Uh, this comes to enforcement. The law is that people should not develop the informally develop the flood plains, but people are still there. I think just after the flood in 2015, uh, that is June 3rd, some facilities, some informal settlements along the uh, flood plains were removed. Very they commenced yeah. some. Yeah. some. Whose, whose responsibility is it? Um, with you as an engineer, do you direct and say that these areas, these are areas that are going to cause problems, and so the whichever agency is responsible should ensure that houses in the wrong places should be moved, etc. Whose yeah. domain does that fall into? The engineers, the planners, and so on will inform the assemblies. In fact, it's the assemblies which have the power to drive away people from the flood prone areas because they approve the building permits they allow people to develop certain areas but it appears the people are becoming more recalcitrant than i mean just uh, but yes. Yes. recalcitrant or the fact that because if there is the engineers um, is the assembly's responsibility Definitely. people are coming there mm. we're talking about the lives of people yeah people dying mm. and so if someone is building a structure in a place where they shouldn't do it Shouldn't, is, shouldn't yeah, they make sure that that doesn't happen? Of course, and yes. And it happens probably um, not on their blind side because they are fully aware that these things are happening. Think, yeah, the authorities are aware or even the assemblies are aware that these people are living there. But sometimes it becomes very difficult for them to enforce. 
But that shouldn't have been the situation because uh, you don't have to allow the people there. And if they are there, they will get, uh, of course, yeah. to be swept I, up. I want us to look at this differently. So we, we know that since Ghana became an independent state, mm -hmm. an independent country, yeah. we have always had floods. Yes. Now, in the past 10 years, mm -hmm. this has been exacerbated. In the past, if you look at from about 2005 to mm -hmm. about now, mm -hmm. it, every year it increases. Yeah. There's a higher bill for economic disruptions, a higher bill for people with mental stress. People lose their lives, their life savings, families are destroyed. And over the years, just as you are speaking, you see, we are talking about opening Kole Lagoon, closing Kole Lagoon, uh, uh, desilting gutters, and things like that. That's not any long term, long term plan. Sure. We yeah. are being reactive. Mm -hmm. So, if people are, 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 are in a flat room area, you take Kenke to them, toilet roll, and that ends the solution. What about long term plans? How do we make sure that strict planning works? How do we make sure that if we have NADMO, we don't even want to go into some of the issues in the public domain about yeah. NADMO's response to the five people and two people. Yeah. That one would just make everybody sad. Yeah. The point is, what are long term plans to look at flooding? Yeah, um, I think quite a lot has been done in that uh, uh, respect. Um, government has uh, got uh, support from the World Bank. And for that, they have planned, they began planning Accra with respect to flooding. They've, there is a project called the Garrick Project, which is a Greater Accra Resilience uh, Integrated Project, which uh, first of all gave the consultancy to a foreign firm which has prepared Accra flood race map with respect to the other basin. Yes. And then and a larger extent to the other uh, basins in Accra. This has been, the flood mapping has been completed. Now it's the turn to begin. The, they've identified problem areas. Now it's a, in the situation of executing project, coming into uh, investment. They have identified, uh, um, what do you call it, they've prepared terms of references to engage consultants to carry out the design. These things, they take time anyway. Yes, it do. is not a... Uh, we have to move from one step uh, to, to another. the other. But yes. going forward, you know, when they are for example, when they are construction roads, mm -hmm. um, you know the Oponglo, the Legon Road, mm -hmm. when, when it rains, not even like heavy rains, mm -hmm. when it rains, as soon as it rains, if you are driving, if you have a small car, you probably have to... It's so bad because yes. the I don't know the drainage is blocked or it's not non-existent. Yes. So if they are constructing new roads and with a high road like that, you would expect that they would have done the right thing. Yeah. There would be a big drainage that can take like the flow of water and things like that. And, and we're still drains. building roads. So are they considering all of that and what they are doing? And who is inspecting yeah, and making I, I, sure I'm, that? I, I'm, I'm very happy to tell you that now. Any drainage, I mean, any roadworks takes into account the drainage uh, in the community. But you see, they are, we still have fragmented institutional arrangements. Yeah. Let's say we have highways designing roads, we have urban roads designing uh, roads. Then we have the Minister of Works and Housing with the Hydrological Services Department designing drains. Uh, to Disconnect. take water. Yeah, These but, two. But engineer, they could do a risk adaptation. Risk adaptation, even if whether you are highways, you are hydrological, or if there's a, a component of risk adaptation in, within the, yes. the project, then they yeah. can harmonize that at, yeah. at one level. Mm -hmm. Because now, Accra, they say up to 40%, we are below, what do they call it, sea level, eh? Yes. Oh, yeah. And we're all flat prone. We are all in flat prone. We are, not, we are prone. not below sea level, but we, well, are, we are getting yeah. there. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. what I know has been done well, well, it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> Keta, like the defense walls, yes. the coastal areas. Mm -hmm. There's a fab job on the, the flooding yes. at coastal areas. Mm -hmm. But within the cities, there's not, because you were talking about this resilient cities thing, mm -hmm. which yeah. uh, I know we are, you know, we are signed up to a lot of international accords. Yes. Now, the issue is the cities grow at a rate that planning has to catch up. Catch yes. up. You see? So mm -hmm. as you are saying that the drain, it doesn't end with a the drain. They don't say the road, when it rains, it's fly. You are already talking about drain, but there might yeah. be other factors. Maybe putting some trees along the line or something to, to contain uh, they, that's what we are saying. That I agree with you. You need a long-term plan. Yes. Have we started? Yes, we have started. This particular program, I'm telling you, 
it's looking at drainage, it's looking at flood management, it's looking at sanitation, it's looking at inf uh, informal settlement, how to resettle people from the flood prone areas, and it's looking at institutional arrangement to make sure that the institutions are brought together. That's what the program is looking at. One thing you haven't said this program is looking at, mm -hmm. it's community engagement. Because if there is no aggressive campaign mm -hmm. for communities to know how to dispose of waste, to make sure that they keep waste out of the drains, yeah. to make sure that when you see a waste uh, receptacle, you put your refuse and things in it, then we will build all these fine things and we would go back to I that. So is there a community of, yes. engagement? It's part. What's the, the strategy? No, they've prepared a strategy to deal with the sanitation and solid waste mass management exactly. in the community. It's only that I'm trying to list some of them. I cannot Fantastic. maybe of at course. this time give you all the nitty gritty, just a gist. So there is a component where they have engaged community, uh, social, I think uh, social workers to go around to talk to people. But that is coming in the component where the consultant is uh, to be engaged. We are now in the process of engaging consultants. What about the people already in the system doing their work? Must we engage consultants? The people already doing their work, they can't do it. No, people already, you see now we have NADMO. NADMO is doing quite a number of uh, campaigns. They go around, uh, they talk to community. Each time before the rainy season comes, NADMO goes around. NADMO is already doing this, but um, I mean, they, everybody is limited with resources, so they, you cannot expect them to do uh, very much. They do it to their limitations. That's why this program is coming on board, which will take the areas concerned. They have identified certain low-lying areas like uh, Nima. Nima has some uh, spot areas. Then we go to uh, uh, Aloboshi. There are some spot areas there which are low-lying <coughs> They have visited, in fact, I've been part of it. We visited all those areas and they are identifying the community leaders. Can the general public access this new program to and uh, bring themselves up to date with the new measures being put in place? Where can we find this data? Maybe uh, I, if you contact the ministry, this uh, lead ministry is the Minister of Works and Housing. Yeah. Works and Housing. Yeah. If you get to Minister of Works and Housing, <laughs> we can get access to this document, at least up to the stage of the con uh, project preparation. They have done all that. Okay. Uh -huh. To move from Accra. Yes. To move from Accra. There's flooding in Kumasi. Yes. But much more, the issue of the Bagre Dam. Mm -hmm. When they open it, the north, it's chaotic. Yeah. Meanwhile, we can arrest this water and use it for irrigation. So what does this program go up there for resilience? This particular doesn't program doesn't go up there. But then there had been a program already okay. on the flood modeling of the White Volta, which took into account uh, the Bagri Dam, yes. the spill. Yes. And so there is now a model that they have built, and which is housed at uh, the Hydrological Services Department, okay. which gets the data, the information from mm -hmm. the Bagri Dam, yeah. gets information from the rainfall, and then all these are put together. Then it's fed to mm -hmm. NADMO. Yes. Then NADMO communicates this information to the public. So this, they move. The yes. people move. Exodus. Yes, they but are what supposed if they, to move. If, what if they should live? What about using that water to good use? We can put it to good that use. That is How also, about that's long yes. term. Yeah, for the, quite a long plan? time, that has been... Uh, there, though there are a lot of programs, if you read through engineering documentations and so you see that there have been proposals to harness the water from the white water during time of flooding. Yeah. But it hasn't come on. But now there is a program to bring in uh, investors to look at, not when I mean investors, not, not only foreigners, no, to mm -hmm. look at how they can begin to store in mm -hmm. forms of dams, construct, we have the, uh, the dam proposed at, uh, um, at near Bolgatanga, there's one, one near Daboya. These are all in, pro uh, in, in a program to be undertaken. Engineer Wise Amatepe, thank you for coming to Captured by Women. Thank you. We have been discussing the perennial Accra flooding and our rapid uh, response systems. So the public universities draft bill, is it going to affect the protection of academic freedom? Is it an affront to our country's academics? This is coming right up on Captured by Women.
Welcome back from the break. I am Nansata Yakubu, and this is Captured by Women. So the University Black Bill and the Protection of Academic Freedoms in Ghana, this is a subject that has become a hot public debate currently. Is this new bill an affront to the academia in Ghana? We are joined today by Professor Kwesiyanka, Minister of State in charge of tertiary education. Prof, you are welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you, Captured. We, just to set the tone, we would like to ask, what is new, really new, about this current bill? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, I'm glad you invited me here. But also to say that if people are talking about a public universities bill, I'm not sure there's one already in existence that people should worry or be happy about. But there's one in preparation at the moment, um, which is at its very, at the earliest stages of preparation. Um, incidentally, the impression has been given that um, there's a public universities bill in existence, and which ought to be subjected to debate and discussion. That's uh, which is a little worrying because listening into debates and discussions about um, the public universities bill or bill to be or bill in preparation, there have been so many presumptions and highly erroneous impressions uh, that have been uh, created. I am a little uncomfortable with a situation where the normal processes uh, through which we within the ministry channel new ideas and bills coming up. Let me say that as far as the ministries are concerned, the Ministry of Education in particular, we have our own stakeholders, if it's tertiary education. Key stakeholders are the universities themselves. Key stakeholders are functionaries in the university, vice chancellors themselves. We normally canvas ideas in preparation through the vice chancellors and through officials of the university. They are very key because they are going to activate and implement the policies on our behalf. And what does the government gain in not consulting them, but start rolling out the policies or taking the policies to parliament for debate? Um, we are at the consultation stage at the moment. And it is unfortunate that the impression has been given that the ministry has prepared a bill uh, to be placed before parliament and it's therefore available for scrutiny <laughs> um, and discussion. Let me emphasize this because it is like you are living in the same household, your colleagues uh, with, with a family, and the university is a family. The, ministry, the universities are part of the family of the Ministry of Education, virtually. Um, it's like starting the preparation of a memo towards a policy. So if I may ask, is this a bill to gag students? No, I'm, I'm just, I, this is a preliminary <laughs> statement. And that the memo, the internal memo, haven't been leaked to the social media. Whereas at this stage of the preparation, the memo is insulated. It is an internal affair. You finish all your discussions and consultations and so on and so forth. Um, and, and thereafter, then you put it in the public domain. We haven't even finished the internal consultation. And the memo in preparation has been leaked to the press. It makes us uncomfortable. Because there are quite a number of versions of what people are talking about in the media. There are about four or five different versions. I think what, what's clear is that this is not um, this is a new bill and it's not even done and like you said there was no old one there to compare with and so what we would also like to know is you talked about stakeholders are you engaging actively engaging all the stakeholders yes. that would be concerned with this bill so that everybody knows that um, anybody concerned with this is being looked at the, including students the key stakeholders yes. are universities the key stakeholders are universities we have already put out uh, the draft, the very rough 
draft bill uh, made it available to the vice chancellors of Ghana, consisting of 10 vice chancellors. Um, well, of late, uh, we have acting vice chancellors from the technical universities uh, in addition. Available to the vice chancellors of Ghana, um, they are key stakeholders. Look at this bill, submit your comments on this bill as an internal process mm -hmm. to the university, all outside the purview of the public. Uh, and this is a regular thing that any, uh, many ministries uh, would do. Um, so this is the stage. We have submitted it to the vice chancellors of Ghana. Um, two respective universities have submitted their responses, uh, namely the UDS and the University of Health and Allied Studies. Allied Sciences, sorry, Sciences. at home. Um, the VCG has um, asked for a little more time to consider the responses they are receiving from their respective members. And then after that, they will then, you know, synchronize all this and submit their feedback to the ministry, so to the NCT, okay. the National Council for Tertiary. We haven't reached a stage where we we'll start a public debate okay. on okay. the bill yet. So just to get a little clarity, it says the university draft bill and the protection of academic freedom. Whose protection of academic freedom? I, Are we gagging the students? I'm not sure to where what the limits of freedom. Where's what is the definition for this bill? The, the the academic freedom you have appended to this is not quite clear, but I know there is supposed to be a draft university's bill. In other words, um, each university has their own act or law that set them up. So you have as many acts as there are universities. As universities emerge, you know, acts also emerge, or acts are set up, or acts are instituted to trigger universities. The university or the ministry, so the government is considering that there are quite a number of discrepancies in the respective um, acts that set up universities. And that it may be good for the country if you have at that level of regulation, broad general principles that are established. And that will be a kind of unified act, you know, governing our universities. Of course, we know that Universities have their own idiosyncrasies. The girl grew up or were established based on certain peculiar developments within the community. So they are bound to be different in one way or the other. Such differences are clearly established within the statutes. Statutes are not necessarily, okay, they are regulations. Each university has their own regulation, yes. And those regulations reflect their idiosyncrasies. What is different from tech? from Legon, from Winneba, from Kekos, and so on and so forth. Well, but there are some general broad yeah. principles that uh, the Unified Bill yeah. seeks to establish. Well, I, I think that you've, you've kind of given the premise for the current uh, controversy, that it was supposed to be an internal consultation to get the feedback and then work it. But at the same time, you still would need public Oh. consultation. So let's say the, the, the process has been spared along now, I mean, without any... Because now the public is actually feeding in. So are you going to heed to calls to withdraw? Uh, uh, are you no, withdrawing no, the bill no, no, and no, representing? No, no, is the bill no, being presented? No, no. How are we moving on from this? No. I thought the bill wasn't ready for presentation. Exactly. Is yeah, so that's yeah. what about. Would they, would they leave yes. it now and take what the public is saying as well into consideration? Well, yeah, would, yes, yeah. that's what I'm, I'm sure asking. those will be taken into consideration. Okay. But I think the, the public has panicked too soon. Okay. Um, the impression has been created that this is a new development on the um, democracy horizon, uh, whereby uh, the, the government is going to gag universities, um, are going to freeze their liberties, clamp down universities, and uh, maybe even victimize universities. Um, Sanjay universities and so on and so forth. But I, I still am not so clear. And I don't want to, you know, deal with this particular issue 
when the situation is so amorphous. Yeah. Okay. So what has necessitated the need for <coughs> this bill when we have had universities in existence for all these decades? Why now? Thinking of commonalities among the universities and the um, discrepancies that exist in their respective laws governing universities. Let me cite the example of um, uh, the governance of universities by university councils. Um, some universities uh, restrict their membership to 12, to some 13, 15, some even 21. Uh, would we need a regulation uh, that gives maybe maximum or minimum number? A range, okay. To a yeah, kind of range within which uh, you can operate. Um, for example, if you look at the, some of the acts as they exist now, <clears throat> Uh, quite a number of issues that are very antique and archaic within these. <clears throat> in one of the universities, you still have representation by the CDR, meaning okay. uh, the, the Committee That's for the Defense what, of defense the, defense of the Revolution and so on and so yeah. forth. Uh, this is indeed archaic, and we didn't want it in the 21st century no. uh, law and so on and so forth. Um, you have some of the universities appointing members of council uh, to a two-year tenure, uh, that's our three, and so on and so forth. Can we unify this, harmonize streamline this, it, streamline yeah. this? I want, I want to, okay. I want to know as well, is the new bill touching on curriculum of no, the very, it's not? No, absolutely. In fact, it has absolutely nothing with the freedom of, academic freedom or freedom of speech within universities. Um, Academic freedom simply means freedom to articulate your views, um, freedom on the part of um, students to um, question received dogma so that they don't just take anything for granted and take it as... Okay. As, oh, I, as, I was as talking more like um, the curriculum of the university, no, the it courses, it, it has nothing. It has but, nothing. But, but Prof, it has something on finance, financing of the university, and the I, argument is that it would affect uh, research grants, how universities publish, and things like that, and that's where the academic freedom thing. I would be not. In I would not. As I said, we don't have a draft bill available, as far as I know. Okay. Not to be cited by the public. No, it's still so, a government so internal. I, 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 okay, I don't want to the go big into one. The okay. <laughs> so the big one is let's the let, rename. The rename. <laughs> The that really one, really. even if, the, I mean, the discussions are leading towards a draft bill. So currently, some of the issues in the public domain is the renaming yeah. of the year, to which one of the former presidents has actually come out to give a statement that well, he doesn't even want, if that is the case. Before where, that, yeah. where is the truth in that and where, where should we place that within I'm, this? I'm not, going to avoid, I'm not going to avoid your question. I <laughs> you come to but it. But before that, let me... I advise our colleagues, and uh, I realize that the issue has agitated academia so much. Past vice chancellors are coming yes. in. Everybody feels concerned. I want to um, just assure them that this government is not about to take freedoms from individuals. Not the Nanandu Dankwa Akufuado government. A personality, a principal personality that has pursued free speech, democratic principles over all this period in the past 30 years. It, it is not at this time that this president that is coming to negate everything that he has fought for uh, and leave. If you are taking a good look at the history of um, academic freedom in Ghana, it is not the NPP government or its antecedents that you will identify as having breached academic freedom or freedom of speech right from Bouzier's time through Kufo's time uh, to Akufuado's time. We have been the vanguard, the protectors of freedoms uh, all these years. Those who are, you know, who breach academic freedom. So, so are we really in the are we really in the universities? You people have really captured that. Really captured me. Are we renaming? Are we renaming the university? Should we have new names let or me, not? Let, let me start by saying that I mm -hmm. think we did not sufficiently honor our heroes okay. in the country. When I travel outside the country, you know, to Europe and America, and look at the monuments, the very yes. imposing monuments in you know, various countries. Yes. That is true. 
and you come here, you reach a roundabout in a very small figure. I don't know which figure you're talking about. That is Sometimes correct. a fish. <laughs> <laughs> or a stool. <laughs> or one type of stool or the other. Yeah. What narrative do we have to narrate the history of this country? There's none anywhere, particularly in Accra here. It's much better in Ashanti region. The monuments speak for themselves, and they narrate the histories. I strongly agree. Yes, very strongly. Yes. Not in Accra here, not at the national level. And it is also because we don't have a harmonized national script about our history. There are various contestations. So we are rather fighting eh, than chronicling you know, our, our heroes. We have reached a point where I think we should honor our heroes in a much different way than we have been doing in the past. And that is by identifying universities at the pinnacle of academic glory and naming universities after individuals and notables within society who have achieved significant feats uh, within the country. And that is where the naming of uh, universities um, after individuals, that's where this comes in. We haven't done it well enough. And that is where I'm sure uh, what you are thinking of. Yeah, but, but, but for monuments, why don't we create new monuments and name them? Why do we have to That's exactly the existing monuments? We could, we could do new things and name them after yes. these people so that going forward, it becomes the history. There is but if we already have historical monuments, University of Ghana itself is a historical monument. And when you say University of Ghana, you don't have to explain it's anything else. You don't put any whatever. So if we are going to... Uh, for instance, name that doesn't in itself also negate some of these it, it things we want to promote. It adds on to the university, the, the, the government doesn't seek to replace one name after the other. Hmm? It's not replacing one name over another name, no. We are giving human faces to the universities. We are narrating the history of the country through our universities. Uh, by looking through our universities, you then identify individuals that have played significant roles within the country. And at, I'm sure you have uh, a list of these. Uh, you talked, I'm sure you needed to know about, say, J.J. Rawlings. Um, you needed to know about uh, Park Grant. You needed to yeah, know about uh, the Domo. Uh, the Domo. Liman as well. Uh, Liman was named... Um, that is uh, no, no? For, Liman, is new. for Liman, it was the Polytechnic, okay. it was the um, WA Polytechnic, okay. which is soon to be um, a, a, a WA University of um, a WA Technical University. Mm. Um, and these have not uh, come about mainly because the laws have not been uh, fully established. Uh, so, we are thinking of all this at the same time. You think of the Park Grant, uh, the role he played within the UGCC and the party played towards the achievement of independence because it was, UGCC was the one yeah. body that eventually took us to um, um, independence. Of course, later on there was a CPP that grew out of it. So at this stage of pre-consultation that you have not come out of stakeholders, you're listening to stakeholders now, you're listening to the views from the public, would it? Would you consider what the stakeholders are saying in that we have old structures that have been known for the past six decades with unique names like the University of Ghana. I am an alumnus of the alum yeah. <laughs> University of Ghana. And um, yes, I would, I'd like it to stay the same. That's my personal opinion. But would it be possible to look at, we are developing new universities, polytechnics, um, being upgraded to technical universities, um, the standard of, we could consider those first to be named after our grades or build new monuments like my colleague Nansata mentioned. But there's absolutely nothing wrong in renaming or using the tech, face. Tech and Legon should be left, you know. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's Kwame Kuma. It's Kwame Kuma. It didn't change too much, you know. <laughs> you know, but, 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 but,
control. So you see, so governments you have not, internal. let me make this clear, governments are not seeking to name universities differently. Okay. The processes start with councils, the governing councils. Mm -hmm. They are in charge of the universities. Yes. The councils normally do their own internal consultations, not with the, not just with the individual uh, members of the society or faculty or staff, but also within the community itself that the communities are, the university has been located. Um, so these are nominations that have been done by respective governments, not government, respective councils or universities that seek to name the universities after individuals. So internal consultations would have already taken place on the part of the council itself with okay. members of the community in which, okay. the, but also with the family um, of individuals that are being targeted for the Nominated, okay. Yes. In, in reference to the councils, the, the current draft bill, as it's in the public domain, is also posing that there's going to be too much government appointment on the councils, the university councils, because the, the president will appoint the chair, the chairperson of the council, and then up to about 70% of the members that will constitute a council. So that if a council is nine, nine people, the government appoints five people, including a chair. How, how true are these, these well, things that's making everything so... Once again, educated? you are referring to the, the amorphous... Yes, what is in the public domain. Whatever yeah. is in the public domain, as I said, it's a, it's a draft and people are entitled to make their comments. But um, I think the proposal seeks to address the issue of unlimited numbers. Mm -hmm. ranging from 11, as I said earlier, to about 21. Um, but also a certain degree of redundancy on, on, on council and the struggle and competition for membership of council among various unions. There are quite a number of um, staff organizations within the university, mm -hmm. every university. Um, you have administrators, you have FUSAG, you have TEU, you have UTAG, and so on and so forth. You have the bigger body of convocation itself, uh, who are largely senior members of the community. Um, you have alumni, you know, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so do you seek to ensure that all these bodies are represented? Yeah. Um, to us, that should not be the point. Um, the emphasis should be on the quality of impact okay. that individual members can make on the governance process or the decision-making process on the part of council. It's not merely the numbers, how many, uh, and I'm sure there will be provision to ensure that whichever members or nominees are submitted by the groups ought to be nominees that are not necessarily the president of the association or the secretary but an individual within the body that has specialized skills eh, that can impact on the decision-making process. So right. some of these are taken into consideration whatever eventually emerges, not right. sheer numbers. Our conversation will go on and on. <laughs> Professor Yanka, thank you very much for coming to explain the very early stages of this public universities drug bill that is causing so much, you know, public outcry and controversy. Thank you very much. We are okay. so grateful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We were discussing the public university draft bill that is currently in the, in the public domain, so to speak. We'll be right back after this break. So ladies, what has been the high point for you in this episode? For me, I think with um, having Professor Kwesi Yanka on the show actually enlightened me on what this whole, the new draft bill is about. The fact that they are just in the process of working on it and we would hope that, like he said, they would, con um, they would get in touch with all the stakeholders and make sure that whatever the final bill or the final bill that comes out is representative of what everybody wants and everybody's happy about it. 
So let's hope that they go through the right processes and make everybody happy. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say the issue of the flooding and the fact that there's now uh, a bit of consensus or awareness to work on a longer term plan instead of all the reactive measures that we all know have been happening. However, a flood has just happened. And so usually when there's a flood, you would hear all these issues going down the line, then it dies off until the next flood. The but next flood. Engineer Metepe spoke quite passionately and he's talking about technocrats and technical people taking it much further. So we are looking forward to yeah. a much better environment for yeah. post-rain Accra or other yeah. parts of the country. In the same vein, regarding the flooding, he also highlighted the point where law enforcement, the assembly, has a duty to us uh, in the communities and they need to enforce the bylaws. If they are building in waterways, they must act upon it without fear nor favor. They should bring down the buildings, clear the choke drains, because two minutes of rain should not make us flood six to 12 inches. It's an abomination. Well, yeah. let's hope the plan works and um, they implement it as soon as possible. Ghana wins. Ghana wins. <laughs> Viewers, this has been a great episode of Captured by Women. Join us same time next week on the show. Thanks.